and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today, rounding out Lens Month, we've got Jay Holbin. Um, super excited to uh, have Jay on the show. He is an ASC uh, associate member. He's the co-chair of the ASC Lens Council. It's got a longer name, but I can't quite remember it. Um, he's directed plenty of films. He's produced plenty of films. He's shot plenty of films. He's one of those um, wore many hats kind of guys who uh, didn't, <laughs> you know, you, you hear about the, uh, uh, what's it called? You know, master of none type person. This is a master of many. Um, and so really excited to have him on to round out the lens month. Uh, we talk about everything in this one, so you're definitely going to want to listen. Although I don't know why I'm saying that at the head of the podcast, cause you're listening. Um, but just very excited. I, I really hope that we can have Jay back on, uh, in the future to talk more about, um, cinematography as a whole or filmmaking as a whole, because, um, yeah, it, he just got all the knowledge you could possibly want. He also writes for American Cinematographer. I don't know if I just said that, but uh, the man has, if you go on American Cinematographer, the website, um, or have any American Cinematographer magazines, I've got probably a hundred or so there. Um, he's pro- he, his, his articles are um, necessary reading for uh, cinematographers. So give those a read, but first listen to this. Um, yeah, I'm going to shut up and stop... Uh, um, fawning all over the man. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this in probably the first um, episode of Lens Month, but uh, I recorded these in like May. So, um, you know, we've learned more since then. Things have happened. Uh, so if, if you hear anything and you're like, that sounds a little an- anachronistic, uh, that's why. Um, anyway, on to my conversation with Jay Holden. So the way, the way I usually start is how, what got you into cinematography? Cause I know you, you're not just a, a lens tech or even uh, just a director, or just a cinematography. You've had a pretty storied career so far. So far. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Yeah. It's still at the cusp, right? Yeah. Um, what got me into cinematography is kind of um, what got me into every other aspect of the business. I have uh, wanted to be a film director since I was five. Um, and part of what I learned very early on is uh, to be a really good director, I needed to understand what everybody else was doing. So I, I actually started as an actor and, and as a writer and kind of worked my way through all of the departments. Uh, and cinematography was one of the trades that I you know, wanted to learn on the way up to becoming a better director. And then I found a, a second passion in that. And I, I stayed in that world um, ever since. Sure. Did, uh, when you were coming up, did you have any, um, I mean, what were your inspirations, but did you also have, uh, you know, mentors or anyone that you can point to that really helped you along in in your career path? I I unfortunately didn't. Um, and I'm only mildly bitter about it. Uh, no, they're, they're really, um, you know, my, my education, uh, was books, um, and American cinematographer magazine, but, uh, you know, an extraordinary amount of reading, uh, and learning on my own, um, and I really wasn't fortunate to uh, to have any specific mentors. Um, I had one incredible uh, afternoon spent with Alan Davio um, and got a lot of great advice from him, and that, that meant a lot to me, but uh, that was you know, really just a day. Um, yeah. Everything else kind of been taken at solo. It, it's interesting because we've done maybe... 20 of these interviews and I think only two or three people really said that they had any mentors. It does seem like cinematography is the field is sort of um, populated by a, a large band of uh, renegades as it were to, to coin uh, uh, what's that? what was that? Um, oh, Rel- DD rebels. I was thinking of a, uh... Oh shit. Speaking of books, why can't I Stu Matt, Matt Mashowitz, Mashowitz. Uh, oh yeah, yeah rebels yeah. guide yeah, yeah yeah who had renegade in their name was that nope that's rebel again i'm anyway. not sure about renegade yeah i'm thinking of a <laughs> rebel without without a crew it was the yeah. rodriguez book uh hey, what were some books like that you that even today you would suggest for people to read if they were trying to get into it or, or kind of enhance their craft because obviously asc mag which must be a joy for you to 
now be so integral with. But uh, yeah, any books that Absolutely. are on your uh, being part of AC Mag has always been a, a, a deep honor for me, and I, you know, I'm 20 some odd years into it now, uh, and and still very proud to be part of that. Uh, yeah, um, cinematography, Chris Mankiewicz, Malkowitz. I'm going to slaughter that name, but uh, yeah, and David Mullen. Uh, yep. it, was a, it was a great uh, book early on for me. Um, so it was a, a Shot by Shot by Stephen Katz. Uh, say, um, Lighting for Film and Electronic Cinematography by Dave Vera uh, was another really great one. Of course, the AFC manual. Um, there's uh, uh, Shot in the Dark by Jay Holden and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> behind the lens by Jay Holman, that guy. Uh, those are some great books. No, but um, yeah, there's an extraordinary wealth of books, but those are the ones that really stand out to me that early on were really uh, big, you know, turning points for me in, in kind of learning. Were you a big, uh, I, I say were, but I, I still am. Were you a big like director's commentary kind of guy, DVD special features guy? Cause I know a lot of people were, that was a, a big point, especially for me. Oh, yeah, especially in, in the late 90s, man. That was bread and butter. Uh, learned a, a ton of this. As a matter of fact, I, I just recently went back and, and re-listened to Danny DeVito's commentary on War of the Roses, which is like one of my favorites. Uh, it's not only uh, hysterical, um, but really insightful. I mean, he really shares some great moments um, that were like, you know, again, like turning, like, wow, okay, great. That's something I'm always going to keep in mind. Um the man, the Close Encounters laser disc was really brilliant in the way that they did the commentaries and, and the layouts uh, for that. But sure, yeah, I, I don't listen to them as much now as I used to. But man, in the late '90s and early 2000s, that was the thing. Yeah, because that's. I mean, I'm I'm a, a slightly younger than you. And uh, that was definitely the thing that got me into filmmaking was buying a DVD and ha having there be um, something on there where the people who made the magic were like, so here's how the magic done." And I was a magician as a teenager. So like that, uh -huh. it all felt very uh, interconnected that there was like secrets that you could delight people with. And there was like a small group of people. Now it's a huge group of people. But at the time, it felt very small and kind of... Uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're this type of if you're predisposed to be this type of person, uh, there's like a whole collection of folks that are just like you that like to do the magic. Yeah, that was the you know, that was what American cinematographer was. Uh, I was a kid growing up in Arizona, loving movies, wanting to be part of this business. And everything at that time that you got you know, the Internet didn't exist because I'm an old man. Uh, but everything at that time that you would get your hands on that was movies was was all about the celebrities and the actors and you'd find American cinematographer on the newsstand and just devour it because it gave the insights. You know, it got that look behind the scenes into the real magic of making movies. Uh, so yeah, when, again, laser discs uh, were a thing and the commentaries were on that and the DVDs, that was gold. When you get a good one. Yeah. I, I just watched the, uh, I just watched Hellboy two and there's, there's a documentary about the making of that's longer than the movie. And I just love that. It's and and also too that I feel like there's, I've definitely seen some like here's how we made it documentaries, but I also really enjoy the, um, uh, what Adam Savage calls the like it's not here's how it was made, but here's what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, f kind of follow alongs. I think those are are also valuable because they don't because I think if you try to do a here's how it's made, you'll cut out all the places where you screwed up. Whereas a here's what happened is a lot more like and then this happened and then this definitely happened and you. <laughs> You know, and I feel like those are more instructive and more valuable, but no one wants to highlight their failures. Absolutely. I, I actually, I put out a product uh, a little over a decade ago called Filmmaker in a Box. That was uh, 17 and a half hours of documentary material on the making of a micro budget feature film. Mm. And the whole idea was to provide every step from development through posts, documented. Uh, every document in the production, every contract, uh, the budget, the script, the script supervisor's notes, everything was available to give the full experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every mistake that was made, every you know, good choice that was made, and documented as this intense case study. 
so yeah, I, I put that out there uh, for people to to learn from. Take this is what we did, good and bad, and uh, run from there. Is that product still available? It is. It, it's uh, online now on the Udemy platform. Uh, it's oh, called cool. Filming Her in a Box. Uh, so the, the physical DVDs aren't being sold anymore, but the uh, the whole program is uh, is online. Awesome. So what got you? Uh, did obviously you're here for for Lens Month, but uh, I, I, I'd be stupid to not ask you more questions about you know the the industry as a whole, just because you're um, so accomplished. But uh, what got you so focused into lenses? Was it just kind of like one day you were writing an article and then it just kept going and going, or what? Uh, how did that come about? Because you are like the lens guy for the ASC, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I, I do chair the uh, the lens committee for the ASC's Motion Imaging Technology Council. Uh, so I guess that technically makes me the lens guy for the ASC. <laughs> um, it, was, it, it was a discovery that I knew nothing about lenses that got me into lenses. So somewhat embarrassingly, uh, during the, the my career as a cinematographer, um, I really didn't know much about lenses. And it was true of most of my contemporaries at that time that my experience, because I mostly shot with Panavision cameras, was super speeds, normal speeds, and primos, which I never really got to play with. And all the anamorphics were always rented out. So that's what I knew. I knew normal speeds and, and super speeds. Uh, and there was a, a few years ago, uh, I guess now about eight, nine years ago, I was doing a series of, of lectures that uh, was sponsored by Panavision. I was doing them at Panavision. And I was asked to do a lecture on lenses. So I put together a, you know, a two, two and a half hour lecture talking about lenses and focal lengths. And uh, Guy McVicker, who was the lens guru at Panavision Hollywood, sat in on that lecture. Uh, and after it, um, you know, gave me some really nice compliments and said, hey, it was a great job. Um, but do you want to hear my spiel? I was like, hell yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I said, okay, you know, come out next week and, uh, and let me do my thing for you. And I grabbed my buddy, Christopher Probst, and we went out and uh, spent a few hours with a guy who just melted our brain uh, and realized at that moment, I know nothing about lenses. I know absolutely nothing about this world and, and it's truly extraordinary. And Chris and I, uh, about a week or two later, went back to Panavision and we spent a couple of days uh, testing every 50 millimeter lens that they had. And that test uh, kind of putting together side by side images really informed, oh my God, there's a whole world to image control in understanding glass. And that led to um, me teaching uh, a class on optics for the Global Cinematography Institute that I was already teaching for and kind of pushing for let's let me share this information that I've learned writing a couple of articles for DB magazine and then I came up with a really stupid idea of this should be a book <laughs> and I went to Christopher and I said hey do you want to do a book with me and he was like yeah yeah let's do it and at that time that test that we did at Panavision turned him on the K35s turned him on to starting to invest in lenses and starting to look into rehousing. Uh, and so it sent us both on this crazy tangent. And for the last seven years, we've been working on this book on city lenses that'll be out at the end of this year. Yeah. Oh, good. I was going to ask when that comes out. Cause that was something that uh, Ryan Avery had, had mentioned. He was like, yeah, they're working on like what seems to be the most comprehensive sort of uh, what would you call it? Like encyclopedia of, of lenses. I'm calling it a treatise, but um, <laughs> yeah, there are aspects of encyclopedia. There are aspects of 101. There are aspects of uh, you know, just a standard reference book. Um, it takes uh, from the very basics of this is what a lens is and this is what all the markings are uh, through the understanding of optical design, through the understanding of optomechanical design, uh, through um, care, testing, maintenance. Um, into the evolution of cine lens design from the Petzval portrait all the way through the Optimo Primes. Uh, and we you know, detail over 200 family of lenses and their evolution. And it's a monster. Well, I'm honestly like, I'm, I'm happy that you 
spent the time to do that because, and I'm also happy that you said you didn't know anything about lenses because when I started to talk to Matthew, I'd, I'd worked with Matthew on like a, a kind of a side project and, uh, now, and I thought, you know, lens, I, I get it, I guess. And then I did the interview for this and I was like, at the end of it, I was like, I just, I didn't ask him anything cause I didn't realize what I don't know. And then I got to Alex and then that happened again. And then the other day with Ryan, I really realized how little I know. And I think the problem was, is that, you know, the classic, you don't know what you don't know. And so I'm wondering, is there anything, is there any sort of blind spots that you see in sort of, let's say your day-to-day cinematographer with lensing that, um, you could help illuminate, uh, you know, cause right now it does, it feels like if, if I were to, you know, just only speak about myself, it does, you kind of just maybe go on a forum online or you ask your friends, like, what do you like? And the answer is usually like, Oh, Ari mini with cook S fours, duh. And you go, good, that looks good, but you don't have like a, a, a reasoning or you don't know what is bringing that. We're also camera focused. We know so much about, well, <laughs> some people know so much about, bit depth and logs and all kinds, you know, input transforms and resolve and all this stuff. But we don't know about just the oldest part of the camera, the lens. Well, it's the the interesting aspect of it. Back in the world of shooting film, uh, the lens was was just a tool to get the image onto the the emulsion. And the emulsion was really uh, where you had the character of the image, you know, how what film stock you chose. Uh, how you expose that film stock, how you develop that film stock, how you printed that stock. That was where the character of the image uh, and the creative process of the image really where the heart of it was. In the digital world, that's become a lot more, um, uh, it, I, I'm at a loss for a word there. Uh, it's kind of standardized. Unified. Yeah, yeah, standardized or, or, or unified uh, across platforms. You know, you can make every camera look identical uh right. and there are you know pros and cons to, to every camera but for the most part it's a flat playing field that's where the lens really imparts an extraordinary aspect of the creative character of the image and understanding that is, is a powerful tool for the cinematographer that a lens choice isn't just you know what's available to me or you know my variation of focal lengths but within the optical design and within the particular vintage are different looks that you can impart on the image and you can bake into the image. So an understanding of the differences between Cook S4 and Panavision Primo and a K35 and a a Schneider Xenon uh, will give you a body of tools in which to help create better character to tell a story. Yeah, because uh, I think you obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but from my sort of timeline, it did seem that uh, independent film, all the um, lenses were built into the body, you know, your DV cameras for the most part. And then when we were able to attach other lenses, all the options were stills and we still were not thinking of character. It was just like depth of field. And then for the for the longest time, it feels like, uh, you know, your choice of lens uh, if we are to believe the marketing hype comes down to how wide open can it be and how sharp is the image, which in mm-hmm. some ways I suppose are opposing uh, <laughs> things to some degree. Um, talk to me more about what uh, kind of character um, a, a lens can impart, because I don't think, especially for people starting, don't I don't think a lot of people realize just how much like micro contrast or, or I guess macro contrast or, or even just fall off can fall off can really affect how something looks. Absolutely. Those, those are very subtle things that are hard to quantify. Uh, when you're talking about acutance or or micro contrasts, um, that gives a, a shape to the transition between what is in focus and what is not in focus. Uh, and in some lenses that can be a very sharp, transition and in other lenses that could be a very gradual transition what you were talking about as far as roll off but that's a really subtle aspect that again is is hard to quantify is hard to to show the bigger things um, that are easier 
to see and then make a bigger difference between families and lenses are, are some of the aberrations, uh, mm -hmm. especially spherical aberration. The amount of spherical aberration within an optical design really has a lot to play, a big role to play in character. It can have a, a huge role in the way that skin tones are represented, in the way that skin texture is represented, in the way that out of focus is represented, whether it is uh, you know, an overcorrected spherical aberration that gives you more sharper out of, out of focus aspects, which is kind of a contradictory concept, but you have, uh, if you're looking at bouquet highlights, you can have sharp edges around them, or you can have undercorrected spherical aberration that gives you really organic bouquet that just kind of falls off and melts into the background. And those two differences can be huge in the representation of an image. Uh, flare is a major factor in character of lens, uh, especially veiling glare. So the lens's ability to control veiling glare is a huge factor in contrast, in color saturation, in skin tone representation, and understanding how coatings play a role in that uh, helps to understand how you choose your lenses. To know that you know, Panavision Primos or Leica Sumalux Cs have really strong coating that controls that flare quality, whereas you know, K35s or Xenons or uh, even super speeds don't have that strong flare control. So you get more veiling glare and you get less contrast and you get a little softer image, even though it's sharp. Right. And by veiling glare, you you mean um, sort of the effect of, to put it in a weird way, like a filter would have that, that's mm -hmm. that sort of full image um, reduction in contrast. Exactly. Nice. Veiling glare is a, is a featureless, shapeless, loss of contrast and uh, color saturation. Uh, so it's, a, it's an overall haze to the image. And it happens, you know, in your setup right there, the bright window behind you, the lens that you're using has really good veiling glare control. Otherwise your blacks would be really washed out by that window. So if we're using a vintage lens with less uh, coating control, you would have a lot less blacks and a lot uh, softer image from that window in the background. Gotcha. Yeah, this is a for anyone watching. It's a it's the Canon Forty Pancake. No, oh, nice. <laughs> which which looks hilarious on my C five hundred. You know, it's like C five hundred V lock transmitter lens. It looks like a body cap. You know. <laughs> um. So you you guys have been doing uh how how many times a year or is it just once a year that you have the uh, sort of get togethers at the clubhouse where everyone kind of just talks about lenses and the, you know, the manufacturers come in and stuff like that. Uh, well, that varies uh, substantially based on, you know, individual schedules and, and work schedules and the clubhouse schedules. Uh, we try to meet uh, at least every quarter um, mm -hmm. for the lens committee. It doesn't always necessarily work out that way. And COVID of course you know, changed everything for everyone. Right. Uh, right. But generally trying to meet about it every quarter um, with the projects that are happening with the lens committee. And, and what? Go ahead. I was going to say there, there's about uh, 68 uh, members of that committee representing um, cinematographers, lens technicians, rental houses, camera companies, lens companies. Uh, we try to run the full game. And what do those conversations sort of consist of? Because I assume cinematographers are just asking for smaller, lighter, brighter, or, you know, what, what, uh, because one thing that Ryan was saying, saying was that his job is to uh, convert what cinematographers want into, uh, um, what would you call it, mechanical speak, uh, 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 engineer yeah, sure. speak. There yeah. you go. Um, what are those things that that uh, sort of the the cinematographers at the at the higher end? Uh, what are those things that they're looking for generally? Oh man, that varies. It varies depending upon who you talk to. Uh, you know, if you go to a, a Greg Frazier, uh, Greg is looking for character. He's looking for something to give a shape and a feel to his image. He's reaching for more vintage and more uh, aberrant lenses than, say, uh, Roger Deakins. You know, Roger Deakins um, or Caleb de Chanel uh, wants a very clean, neutral lens, and they want to do all of the shaping of the image through their lighting. Uh, so it 
varies substantially depending upon the creative individual who's talking about it. Um, you know, somebody like uh, Matty Libatik, uh, again, is going to reach for lenses that flare more and lenses with a little more aberration and, and more character to them that shape that image, which is why he's leaning on Kawa um, anamorphics or uh, the Cook uh, SF um, anamorphics, you know, the, the super flare kind of as, as his general tools for the last couple of projects. So it really, it depends on who you talk to. Mm. Do the, uh, do the engineering types always kind of take whatever they're getting and go and give it the classic, like, Hmm, okay. And then turn around and try to, what am I trying to say? Are they trying to meet demand or are they trying to figure out how much they can sell for the most yes. part? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, again, that depends on who you talk to. You know, it, one of the uh, interesting things about, say, uh, Panavision or Hawk uh, is that uh, Hawk's a little bit of a hybrid, but Panavision doesn't sell their product. Right. So they're not worried about uh, the, the, uh, the sales price or, you know, the return on, um, on that particular research and development. They can listen to a cinematographer who says, I'm really looking for a super sharp lens that has incredible flair. I say, oh, okay, well, interesting. And they go make a series of lenses for that cinematographer that then maybe they'll, you know, produce more of them. Uh, Hawk can do the same thing. They listen to their cinematographers and say, oh, we love your C series, uh, but we really want something that uh, has a little bit better edge to edge performance. And I say, okay, well, we're gonna come out with a B series. Uh, and then, ah, uh, you know, we like the B series, but it's a little too much. Let's do a little bit more flair. Okay, now we're going to come out with the bead lights. You know, it's a little faster. Okay, you know, maybe a little more. Okay, now we're going to have the bead light vintage, uh, and they can release you know, a new line for every concept. Where yeah, you have a company more like, no. sorry, no, go ahead, go ahead. Where you have a company more like Zeiss, they have to sell their lenses, so they have to listen to the cinematographers and find a more universal product that's going to appeal to a larger base so that as they put the millions of dollars into research and, and development and manufacturing, they can get that back by selling a, you know, a large number of lenses. So there's a, it depends on, again. Totally. Who, who uh, are you chatting? Well, and I, I suppose that answer uh, helped, helped me figure out what I was trying to say, which is what is more universally Except again, I, I'm just, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I'm trying to get a, 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 a reading on just what um, the landscape of lensing is, is, is the universal, um, so, so to speak, average cinematographer looking for brighter, sharper, the end, or is that push towards vintage? Because, you know, as K counts went up and as d dynamic range went up, it seems like we walked further away from clinical and closer to let's buy, let's buy out every Canon FD on eBay uh, and, and go from there. Are lens companies leaning back into vintage or is it still, let's keep it clinical? No, they're definitely those larger companies. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. They're definitely following that trend. And, and it's, it's a difficult thing for a lens company to do uh, because yes, for the longest time, the progress, the process was, produce a lens that is faster, sharper, more contrast. And that's the evolution of optics generally from the first photographic lens all the way through the end of the 1990s. So there was one track. And if you're an optical designer or uh, you know, an optical engineer, that's, that's where your mindset is. I have to create a better performing lens that's going to deliver more contrast and better sharpness at a faster speed, uh, and then it started to be okay. So we try to make them more compact, and, and we try to make them, them more universal in size, and make the markings similar. And, and the, these trends started in the late '90s into the 2000s. But now, exactly like you said, because we have digital cameras that have made the image more uh, flatline, uh, the trend is to go to more vintage and more character, and the manufacturers are having. They have to respond to that. And it's a struggle. You know, there's nothing more fascinating than to watch lens engineers, opt opt mechanical engineers and, and uh, optical designers watch a 
camera test with a cinematographer and a director. Because they'll be back by the monitor watching all these things going, oh my God, that's a terrible lens. Look at that. That's, <laughs> that's horrible. And then the director will be like, that's great. That's what I love. And the optical designer is like, what? Wait, wait, what? This, this is a terrible lens. It has horrible spherical aberration. It has no edge to edge performance. The fall off is, is it? yep. I love it. That's what I want. And then just watch their melt, their brains melt because everything they've done is fighting against that. Right. Uh, and what we're liking in lenses creatively are faults, technically speaking. So it's difficult to get a company, you know, especially like a, a a German company like Zeiss that is wants precision and wants perfection to say, no, we need to step back and we need to create a series of lenses that caters to the creatives. So they take the you know, Zeiss Supremes and take a step back and create the Zeiss Supreme Radiance version that allow more flair and control of flair. Um, to cater to those audiences. So yeah, the, all of the companies are having to do that. That's Anjadu has you know, stepped up and said, we're gonna give you a series of lenses that are custom tunable. So you can swap out an optic uh, within the design. You can change out your iris. You can add an additional element to the rear of the lens to alter the character of this series of lenses to what you want. And I think that's a very smart move. Do you see the sort of, um, it's, I talked about this in the last podcast, but it is the sort of influx of just rehousing tons of stills lenses. Is that like fun and exciting or is it kind of complicating things? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I think it is incredibly fun and exciting. It, it's, it's exciting to find, um, glass that, that looks good and that works. And that helps to tell a story. Um, rehousing lenses is not a new thing. You know, this is this has been happening uh, dating back really to the '40s and '50s. Um, you know, taking and repurposing glass from other sources and, and utilizing them. The trend now, um, I think, really started with the excess of owner operators of cameras uh, and i'll pin that back to the you know the release of the red one uh, prior to that the you know barrier of entry to being an owner operator um, of a 35 millimeter motion picture camera was about a quarter of a million dollars right then you know there were digital cameras that you know not a lot of people took very seriously but again the, like the the f900 was, was about a quarter of a million dollars. Red introduces a professional tool, and that was a little questionable with the Red One, but at an extraordinary price, you know, at $30,000, uh, that allowed a ton of people to suddenly enter the business. And that placed a massive demand on optics that just was not service. So suddenly there is, you know, 10,000 PL cameras in the field that weren't there prior to that. And this incredible demand on lenses and people are reaching for, okay, what's available and what can I afford? And that opened up all these doors to still lenses, uh, whether that, you know, the EF or, or the Nikon mounts or the Olympus mount, and there's beautiful glass out there. Um, so now there's this trend of rehousing more and more of these into the cinema style mechanics but maintaining the look of that beautiful glass from Olympus and Nikon or uh, Canon. That Just actually, for sure. I I'm 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 gonna ask you a question that sucks. Uh, can you define for me? Because I f I feel like I'm <laughs> not. I mean, I'm sure I've already done three or four. But uh, what? How do you define a cinema lens? Because it does feel like online people are, uh, and the only reason I say online is because that's where the discussion is, especially now that we can't hang out and see each other. But, uh, oh, I, you know, I, I just picked up a cinema lens. It's, I, I, this is going to be great. And it's like, well, are you an owner operator by yourself? Because I think you just made your job harder, you know? <laughs> and also, do you even know what it looks like? 
no, but it's cinema style. So now I yeah, know it's good. It's got gears um, on it. No, nothing beats online forums for uh, something telling you whether it's a good lens or a bad lens, because everybody has an opinion, right? Um, so the answer to that question is mechanics. The, the, the real difference between a still lens and a cinema lens is that, and you touched on it, the cinema lens is designed for a second person to manually adjust the focus while another person controls the camera. Uh, this is not true of stills lenses. This is not true of broadcast or ENG lenses. Uh, it is a, something that is unique to the cinema world. So to design a lens for that, one of the first things that you need is that you have to remove the hand from touching the lens, to remove the focus control from physically touching the barrel of the lens, which means we put a gear around the focus. And that's one of the main things that separates a still lens from a cinema lens is that 0.8 module 32 pitch standard gear. So that allows me to put a follow focus to separate that physical connection or a remote follow focus. The next thing is the increase in resolution of focus markings. So still lenses, especially uh, starting in the uh, 80s, you know, the early 80s, uh, were designed for autofocus. And autofocus, the way to achieve that is to move the lens elements as little as possible and to keep that focus distance, that resolution of marks as small as possible. So that lens is capable of quickly achieving focus and silently achieving focus. And that, that's a huge factor in still lenses. So the focus scales on a still lens, generally speaking, are very small, which means as you are trying to manually focus a still lens, it's incredibly difficult to know where you are between three feet and six feet when you have a quarter of an inch of space and no markings. So a cinema lens has more resolution of markings. It's gonna have three feet, three feet, three inches, three feet, six inches, three feet, nine inches, four feet. And it's going to have more spacing between those markings to give you more precision of focus as you are manually finding focus. Those are your primary things. Then it gets into lens mounts, uh, the standard lens mounts for the motion picture industry being PL uh, or PV or now LPL are much more robust mounts than say EF or the Nikon um, or you know the stills world. They are designed to have heavier lenses to positively lock that lens into the camera to make sure that there is no movement and to make sure that that flange depth is locked and steady, because that's what keeps a resolution of marks accurate, is to make sure that that back focus and that flange depth is accurate. Then you get into aspects like uh, maintaining uh, barrel size between focal lengths, so that as you go from a 25 to a 50 to a 75, your gears positions are in the same position, your barrel diameters are the same, so that all of your accessories are the same. These are other things that separate cine lenses from still lenses. Primarily, it's all mechanics. Yeah, well, and so that I'm I'm happy you ended on that because I think that that's what I see is people going, "I have a cinema lens, therefore my image is good." It's like, no. <laughs> you have a cinema that's lens, silly. therefore your job is harder if you're alone. <laughs> if you are. Uh, a, a one-man band, yes, your job can be harder unless you are actually using a follow focus wheel uh, to adjust focus. But, you know, single operators uh, who are pulling their own focus, that's more in the ENG broadcast world. And then you have a simpler, uh, less tension on the barrel. You have a, you know, a single barrel in which your, your zoom, well, zoom is generally on a motor and that's at your, your other hand but you're pulling your own focus as you're operating. 
that's not the way that the cinema world works. Right. So it's designed for a second person to be there and it's a two person team. Yeah. I suppose a good way to think about it would be like, if you did have a second person, would you want to hand them a stills lens <laughs> or would that make their job really freaking hard? It does. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, as DSLR lenses became more ubiquitous in the film industry and people were shooting with SLR lenses, uh, yeah, it's a super pain to move that technology into the workflow of the cinema world. Um, and that's why we get companies like Duplos uh, doing cine mods to take those lenses and help them mechanically enter into the workflow of the film world. Yeah. Is the, um, is there, has the advancement of lenses specifically, you know, coatings and optical design and all that, and maybe, maybe you should take a moment to differentiate between optomechanical design and optical design, but, uh, has, is, has it been kind of a sliding scale where just every year something else changed or where are there kind of defined, um, eras of of lens design like if you were to think like oh i want a 70s lens for this reason versus an 80s lens or or whatever the you know um chop ups are absolutely uh there are huge milestones i mean it's you know starting back from the 1870s uh in photographic design in you know the the first achromats uh you know the first uh doublets uh, the 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 triplet lens the the planar you know all of these uh original optical designs were huge milestones that we're still living off of now. So lenses that were designed, uh, you know, in 1889 and 1905 and, and 1912 are the basis of optical design that we're using now. Hmm. But beyond that, the most like really significant change uh, came at the end of the 1930s and 1940s, and that was thin film anti-reflection coatings. So this was a, a really a discovery from the teens, but it took until the 30s to figure out how to do it, uh, to artificially apply a thin film coating onto lenses that reduced flare. And when that happens, not only do we reduce flare and get better transmission, but it allowed for more significant optical design because prior to that, optical designers had to limit the number of pieces of glass that they used because every piece of glass would be a reduction of light transmission and increase of flare. So if you went past a triplet, which is literally three pieces of glass, every additional piece of glass that you added increased flare. So you lose contrast, you lose sharpness and you lost transmission. So optical designers were limited. When we introduced anti-reflection coatings, that opened up a whole new world of optical design. Like, oh, wow, we can correct more problems because we can introduce more elements because now we can get better transmission. Hmm. Coatings have evolved substantially. So from the initial coatings in 1940, uh, really about 3940, uh, to the 70s, some minor improvements in the 70s, we got some significant improvements. In the 80s, we got more improvements. In the 90s, we got more improvements uh, to the point where we're now multi-layer coding every element to not only just control flare, but also control color. So this was something that, uh, you know, lights really pioneered uh, right around the time of the Panavision Primos was the ability to control the coloration of an entire family of lenses by refining the optical coatings in every element to get a color matched series of lenses. Mm. And, you know, we're talking about uh, 1990s for that. Oh, so wow. these things are, are still evolving. Um, the introduction of aspheric elements, uh, really about the late 1950s into um, photographic lenses and then cinema lenses. The A sphere helps to do the job of several other optical elements and reduce the number of elements that are necessary and the weight. Um, then you get into you know, free form elements and uh, you get into 
changes in optical glass, <laughs> uh, the, the chemical composition of glass. Uh, and that was something that started very, very, very early on in the late 1800s, uh, but is still happening now that there are so many chemical varieties of a combination of glass that an optical designer can use. Uh, and I think I'm kind of going into the weeds trying to answer your question, but yeah. No, weeds are good. Weeds are good. The more weeds, <laughs> the more I can like grasp things. Uh, but to your point, there's so many, you know, you were saying that um, there's so many chemicals, chemical comp, uh, compositions that they can use to make lenses. But also, uh, I think something that's been brought up a lot is chemicals they can't use. Can't use lead anymore, you know, <laughs> and that apparently right. made the FDs cool or something. Uh, uh, the, there's a lot of there's much ado uh, about that. Uh, and, and there's a lot of magic and, and voodoo attributed to lead. Um, but really what lead did is it increased the refractive index of, of the glass. Mm -hmm. um, the increase of refractive index allows you to make uh, less curvature uh, and uh, smaller um, elements. There's a lot of different chemical compositions that you can do to increase the refractive index. So the magic that's attributed to lead is a little overplayed. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that's... Um, can be incorporated now that replace that quality. Uh, and lead was obviously um, taken out of service due to environmental concerns. Right. And it isn't environmental concerns of the finished glass, it's environmental concerns of the manufacturing process. So that was uh, outlawed first in, in Europe and then that sort of trickled through the rest of the world. Um, but there, you know, there've been a lot of chemicals introduced into lenses, including radioactive elements uh, to change the optical condition of that. Uh, thorium was one of the things that was introduced into lenses in the 1930s to the 70s. And it is, it is a radioactive um, isotope. So there are lenses that uh, you, know, you throw up to a Geiger counter and they're gonna register. They are literally uh, radioactive, not dangerously so, but you know, it's, um, a lot of different things were tried. Sure. I mean, you get radiated when you get in an airplane, so mm -hmm. no, nothing to be scared of if you own one of those. Uh, I like that you mentioned the sort of voodoo and magic, because one thing that I, at the beginning of the talk, me talking about uh, how I loved the magic, I think the the only way to be a magician is to, um, I'm going to start stealing words from like Steve Yedlin and stuff, but like have control over your uh craft whether it be you know knowing how to manipulate a card or or a, a thumb tip or whatever it may be or in our case knowing exactly what a lens or a camera or your imaging pipeline does so that you can be the magician and present the trick and not have the trick happen to you i get you know um to that end how would you and i know you've written if, if, for people listening Jay has put up a shit ton of stuff, uh, both in the magazine and online, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, how would one, uh, how do you recommend one go by evaluating lenses, um, maybe for their specific camera or maybe just in general, um, you know, what kind of tests should they be doing when they go to say a rental house or maybe if they were even to purchase it? Uh, it's a very timely question. There are actually, um, just to, uh, uh, shot craft pieces that I did for American Cinematographer magazine on exactly that topic. Yeah. Uh, so there are. I did read them. <laughs> oh, hey, sweet, cool. Um, there are a lot of different types of, of tests, uh, and I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with any particular way of testing. There's no 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 bad way to do it. I happen to because uh, I'm generally testing a lens. Uh, for the sake of understanding as much of that lens as I possibly can. So there, there's a difference between a generic lens test and a specific project-driven lens test. So if you have a specific project in mind and you are testing lenses for that, then there's a, there's a different process for doing that. You generally want to have uh, subjects that are close to what your talent looks like, you want to have lighting that is similar to what you're going to be doing on that project, maybe even the exact wardrobe or props or locations for that project. And you want to take that image 
through your post-production workflow in order to test those lenses. That's the way to help really determine a look for a specific project. For a generic test, I want to find out as much about that lens as I possibly can in as an efficient way as possible. And there's a couple of different ways that I do that. One is an all-encompassing generic test uh, where a model is seated uh, and flat lit with a, a contrast resolution chart, a color chart in front of a Christmas light uh, background, a black background with Christmas lights on it, uh, and two additional lights that give me flare. So within a single frame, what I'm trying to look at is color rendition, contrast, veiling glare, spot flare, and bokeh. Uh, and I can pack all of that into a single image uh, and test every stop on the lens. And I get a lot of people like, why do you do that? Uh, because the performance of the lens changes. Right. And because I want to learn as much information about that particular lens as possible, I want to test everything. That doesn't mean that most cinematographers aren't going to shoot at a 22. Right. If you know what you're going to use that lens for, great, you don't have to do that. But when I'm doing a generic test, I want to push it as far as I can. Uh, and that's a, a tedious amount of testing, but you can get a lot of it. The other way is to do isolated tests where you just shoot a black background with the Christmas lights. And that way you're just looking at the bouquet of the lens. And you roll focus to test intrafocus and extra focus and see the change of the bouquet. I like to use uh, nets instead of a single strand of Christmas lights. I use these nets that are designed to be thrown over bushes because I wanna cover the entire field of view of the lens because the quality and character of the bouquet changes across the field of the lens from the corners to the center. And I wanna see that in a single field. Um, the next kind of isolated test that I'll do is a flare isolated test, which is again, a black background with a single light source, generally like 150 watt uh, for now. And then I'll put that, uh, you know, eight or 10 feet away and I will take the camera and I'll pan it 180 degrees across that light source. And that'll show me where we start to pick up veiling glare before the light is in shot. When the light is in shot, it's gonna show me how it treats spot flare and ghost flare. And that tells me a lot about the optical design of the lens. Um, and then, you know, you can take a lens out and shoot faces because that's mostly what we shoot. So to see skin tone representation, to see um, distortion of face. And it's very interesting, you know, people, there's a, a lot of information online now uh, about relationship of, of focal length to uh, perspective. Oh, no. And focal length of distance of subject, you know, and, and some great gifts out there where you know people's faces, you know, grow and, and and shrink as you hit them from ten inches with a, a ten mil or a hundred feet with a, a thousand mil, and to right. see what happens to the human face with that. But also within individual optical designs, a fifty millimeter lens from five feet away, ten different manufacturers are gonna have 10 different renditions of the face. So these are important things to kind of see, to see, okay, from uh, the S4 series to uh, super speeds to um, Tokina Vistas, what is it gonna look like on my subject? Uh, that's an important thing to test. Yeah, the, the reason I said, oh no, is because I was having flashbacks to when uh, I was, you know, I bought the C500s and I was having to wrap my head around full frame lenses and uh oh boy that that just gets that gets in the weeds. I had I had uh I was on Roger Deakins's forums and I was asking about his uh experience with them on 1917 and I had asked a stupid question and sure enough who comes after me but David Mullen. <laughs> and I get <laughs> I get a good paragraph uh, of him very politely telling me how stupid I am. And, <laughs> and I was like, shit, I knew 
I knew that I knew that I was wrong and I somehow wheeled myself back. I had read I was on Steve Yedlin's blog for like three days just trying to like go back and realize, you know, because he's a very technical writer. So you kind of have to go back and reread it and go like, uh, do I get it now? And you finish it and you go back. You go, I think I get it now. Um, so, yeah, that's that's why I said, oh, no, I thought you were going to start talking about that. <laughs> uh no, there's there's an awful lot of confusion and, and misinformation uh, about format size and lenses. Um, the bottom line is, is a 50 is a 50 is a 50. Meaning that there's much ado made about crop factor. Right. And most of it you can completely ignore and throw away it has no bearing whatsoever unless you are used to a particular format and you're now shooting with a different format. And the understanding of crop factor will help you understand how the field of view of those lenses is going to change. So, you know, a lot of people will say, uh, you know, you're shooting with Super 35 camera and you have a 50 millimeter lens and you go to a full frame camera that lens now suddenly becomes something different. Right. It, it doesn't. It's, ex it's exactly the same thing. Field of view is different depending upon the format you're on. So a 50 millimeter lens on an eight millimeter camera is a very long lens with a very short field of view, very shallow field of view. You take that exact same 50 millimeter lens, you put it on a 16 millimeter camera, it now is a medium field of view. You put it on a 35 millimeter camera, it's now a standard base field of view. You put it on a large format camera, it's now a wide lens. It's still a 50 millimeter lens. 50 has never changed. But well, based so on the format, the field of view changes. Well, and the, and the number one, uh, correct me if you think something supersedes this, but I, the number one piece of misinformation that I see is Shooting full frame allows you to shoot longer lenses and therefore less distortion. Yeah, that, that's not true. Distortion, uh, there is geometric distortion in lenses. But what most people are talking about distortion is uh, the relationship of the camera distance to your subject. And that is independent of focal length. If you are able to take a hundred millimeter lens and put it an inch away from a face, that lens will distort the perspective of that face just as much as a 10 millimeter lens, 10 inches away from the face. You're just seeing a much smaller portion of the image, so it's hard to tell. But distortion is based on the relative distance of the subject to the lens, not the focal length of the lens. That is definitely a misnomer. Uh, also, uh, right along those same lines, a lot of people are saying that because you're shooting with longer focal length lenses, you're compressing your foreground and your background more in a larger format, and that is not true either. Compression of foreground and background is, again, the relationship of the distance of your lens to your subject. And if that doesn't change, neither does the compression. Yeah. There's a wonderful yeah. test. Um, Manuel Lubers, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, did an extraordinary evaluation of a Alexa Mini to an Alexa 65 I've seen on that. a simultaneous 3D uh, beam splitter rig to dispel all of these misnomers uh, and misunderstandings. And it, it, it's truly extraordinary. I recommend everybody check it out. I I do too. Unfortunately, yesterday I saw someone cite that as proof that the 65 had less distortion than the mini. <laughs> luckily, well, everyone, luckily everyone was correcting him, but it yeah, was like, yeah. what are we doing, man? Like that was the whole, that was the thesis. By the way, one of the most beautifully shot tests oh, I've yeah, seen in yeah. a minute. Um, yeah, we wound up uh, getting images from him to use in the book because uh, A, what he did is beautiful, 
uh, B, it's very expensive to, to put that particular test together and difficult and time consuming. And we just, there was no way that we were going to do it better than what he did. So we got his permission to put several images uh, from that test into the book to illustrate these uh, and correct these misunderstandings. So cool. um, we're, we're about up on time, but is there anything um, that is exciting you about the let's we'll, we'll open it up to the whole world of cinematography again but like what what are things kind of that are um you're excited to to see that are new or maybe even excited to see leave uh you know in in our uh art form oh wow i don't know if i really have an answer to that i i think that um every tool has its use and every technique has its use you know, when I was uh, when I was coming up primarily uh, as a DP in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, things like zooms were like a like a no no. Like nobody liked a zoom lens, and, and you never zoom in a shot. That was like, oh my god, total amateur hour. Right. But that that's absolute BS. Uh, and, and there are extraordinary cinematographers like John Seal, uh, who were brilliant with a zoom lens. And the way that they would nest a zoom into a dolly or into a crane move uh, and do extraordinary work with it. So even things that you kind of dismiss, like drones are a little overused right now, or uh, you know, stabilizers and, and crazy, you know, pass-through shots going through a car window or something are perhaps a little bit overused right now. But those techniques have their place. Uh, so I, I don't, there's nothing that I'm really like, oh this is coming and man, it's going to be amazing. And there's nothing that I really hate either. Sure. Um, other than people saying that that particular lens or that particular tool is crap. Because I don't think that that's, that exists. Every tool has its job. The iPhone, you know, is, is an incredible tool uh, and can be very well used. A GoPro can be an incredible tool. HDSLRs are, are amazing tools. Um, Technology snobbery is uh, is just frustrating and um, defeatist. So I, I love everything. Bring it in, and if it helps tell the story, great. Yeah, I think a lot of that tech snobbery just comes from um, insecurity. I bought the newest, coolest thing, and if there's a newer, cooler thing that comes out, my value is somehow lowered. Um, hooey. Uh, so I, I like to end every podcast asking, uh, the same two questions. And, uh, I think we already answered the second one, but, um, what, th uh, it can be an object or a life change or uh, a resource or something. What thing off the top of your head can you point to as having the biggest, um, effect on you in your career as a cinematographer, uh, that kind of brought you to that next level or allowed you to, um, get to where you are today or that you use most often? Uh, the first thing that pops in my head is uh, the technique of shadow side the camera um, was one of the things that elevated my work uh, exponentially almost overnight. Uh, just the, that simple concept of keying from the you know, off camera side or putting shadow side to camera um, adds a particular depth and cinematic look uh, to the image that really was a massive you know change uh, in the quality of my work and it was something that I, I like to pass on as uh, well, it's kind of in this setup a little bit um, I was gonna say yeah look it's it's right here but only if I yeah, it's not really only if I'm over here is it shadow side again um, mm. But that was a technique that was like, oh, wow, that was game changing for me. Yeah, the, uh, you know, we, we've had some, you know, some, you know, buying a light meter was one. And then also so was a good pair of shoes, which I think was the Magnum Photos has a whole book called uh, like buy good shoes or something like that. <laughs> that was one of Steven Spielberg's advice to young filmmakers is, is get good shoes. Yeah, um, that's good advice. And actually, I just met with a young filmmaker earlier today, and that was one of the pieces of advice I passed on was, was uh, really good shoes. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're an operator, get a good back brace. Back support, oh. take care of the back. 
I'm I'm I finally hit the age where that really uh is more important now than ever. Early 20s, man, he's operating all kinds of like that. No problem. Everything's fine. Now it's like just doing this sitting on this weird stool like I'm going to be aching for t- 10 minutes. Yeah. Um and then the uh, final question, is there anything that you would like to promote to the audience that you'd like uh, them to check out or anything to, like that? Well, absolutely. The Cine Lens Manual is going to be coming out at the end of this year. Uh, you can track that progress on the Instagrams at Cine Lens Manual. Uh, that's kind of the big thing that i um, looking to promote. Obviously, uh, American Cinematographer, I got a couple of books that are uh, out in the field uh, doing a, a revised, updated version of my first book that will I don't know when that's coming out, but sometime in the not too distant future. Um, but yeah, follow along uh, with me on the Instagrams at Jay Holden. And uh, thanks for having us talk with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, man, thank you. I uh, I'll have to have you back on when that book comes out, and also uh, when we can talk about something I, I know more of. I feel like these past four podcasts have just been me going like, "I'm stupid. Can you help me be not stupid?" <laughs> Not stupid at all, man. You are are seeking the knowledge, and then that's uh, what what you got to do. Just never stop work. I appreciate it. Well, uh, yeah, like I said, thanks again, and um, we'll we'll talk soon. Absolutely, my pleasure. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the FNR Mapbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.